Levi, the hard road to shoe. Damn, how high and dangerous. The road to shoe is hard, harder than climbing to the sky. Sansong and Yu Fu were first to find this boundless land. Forty thousand years went by before Falk risked the border pass to settle here. West, there's Great White Mountain, with only pathways fit for birds towards the peak of Mount M.A. Brave men have died in sudden landslides on stairs of stone that hook to heaven. At the topmost peak, six dragons guard the sun. Below, charging waves attack the river's progress. Even skillful cranes can't fly across, and monkeys sulk that they are stuck below. Those winding paths of green clay mountain, they zigzag through the boulders, nine turns each hundred steps. Touch Orion, pass by Gemini, gazing up with awe. Touch your chest, sit down and gasp for breath. When will the traveller heading west turn back? These cliffs are just too hazardous to climb. Birds cry mournfully in ancient trees. Males pursued by females flutter through the woods and listen to that cuckoo crying to the moon, voicing her sorrow at the empty mountain. The road to Shu is hard, harder than climbing to the sky. Bold men's faces pale on hearing of these perils. Clustered peaks barely a foot from the sky. Withered pine trees upside down, hanging over cliffs. Flying waterfalls cascade with deafening din. Boulders roll and thunder into ravines below. With danger like this, after travelling so far, why end up here at all? Sword Tower stands on one of the steepest spots. If one man guards this path, ten thousand won't break through. But if the guards are bandits, it's home to wolves and jackals. In daylight, watch for savage tigers. At night, avoid the serpents, with gnashing teeth that dribble blood and slash like a knife through hemp. It's fine to dream of the brocade city, but better to have stayed at home. The road to Shu is hard, harder than climbing to the sky, but I'll crawl on westward with a heavy sigh. So, this is the first of Li Bai's uh, heptasyllabic ballads. He has quite a few in this collection. Three, four, five, six, seven. He has seven in total. He also had a few, if I remember well, in the pentasyllabic uh, Joyfu. Now, Levi, we've talked about him before, was uh, the sage of poetry, and he was specially at his best in the free and unrestrained subject matters, and also in the free and unrestrained metrical forms, which means he took a predilection and he excelled in uh, Gushi or in Joyfu. Those were the poems where he had the greatest metrical freedom and... Uh, where, uh, where, where he was able to excel, as we say. Although he was a very prolific poet, he has many and, uh, and very good poet, poems in, in other genres, including the standard Tang regulated poem, the Lu Xi, of which we will start to talk when we finish this section of the book. So this is a ballad based on an old title, The Hard Road to Shu, or I've seen it translated elsewhere as The Road to Shu is Hard. So, uh, very quickly, we need to introduce Shu. I think I already mentioned the old region of Shu because a few poems did take place there or, or, or whereabouts or, or nearby. Shu is a region in the west of China, 
Uh, it's uh, more or less the equivalent of the modern province of Sichuan. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, one of its characteristics is that it's, uh, it's almost completely isolated by strong mountain chains. So uh, at least from, to, to the west there is Tibet, and you know when Tibet was a hostile power, uh, that was a, a, a place from which troops did come and invade Sichuan. And, but on the eastern and southern and northern sides, where it borders on all the other Chinese heartland territories, uh, there were only a few mountain passes that allowed for safe entrance into Shu. So Shu, as I said, the old name of Sichuan. So uh, Shu was a very protected area. Uh, its accesses were difficult. And, uh, you know, in times of turmoil or when, when the empire was divided into different states, which happened quite a lot, uh, Shu was usually one of those states, and one in which its rulers could safely last for some time ensconced uh, within those natural barriers of the land. So I imagine this poem is inspired in a Juefu in a ballad with that title that might have described the hardships of travelling or of trying to enter Shu. And that's what the topic of this poem is. Li Bai is making a, a, a description of the main accesses, or, or at least the main one, uh, and, and the mountains surrounding, like a girdle, the land of Shu. And he emphasizes how wild, how difficult, how tall those mountains are. In the typically Li Bai fashion, his description falls on the slightly hyperbolic. But, you know, it's, it's pretty well done, it's pretty effective. So the topic of this poem is uh, the region of Shu, more specifically, the difficult access to the region of Shu, its mountain barriers, its mountain passes that grow high, almost touching the sky. Minor topic, not, not really in, 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 in the first line uh, of, 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 of topic uh, importance, but uh, the traveler, so, so moving, uh, traveling, uh, wandering, exile, is a, a sub-theme because the poet seems to be placing his, uh, his voice, his poetic persona, into the words of a, a traveller that is travelling uh, to uh, Shu, and which might be taken to be uh, Li Bai himself. But we don't get many details about this traveller. He feels really it's just an excuse to describe uh, those mountain passes uh, and those high elevations that lead to the land of, of Shu. Uh, one of the things it retains from balladry, and that's interesting, is uh, the refrain which it repeats. So the road to Shu is hard, harder than climbing the sky. It's introduced at the beginning. First there is an explanative, an exclamation, and then we have this line, the road to Shu is hard, harder than climbing the sky. And a few stanzas later, some four or five stanzas later, it comes again. The road to Shu is hard, harder than climbing to the sky. And at the end of the poem it is repeated, although a sentence is appended to it as we as we shall see in a moment. So let's go, uh, uh, as for sections of the poem, you could say that its sections are the different spaces it describes. Uh, yeah, the poem starts uh, with, with, um, with the proclamation through the refrain of the difficulty of, of, of traveling to Shu, and then it starts describing those difficulties. First, there's a small stanza that explains the background, and the, you know, the population background of the area, then we have a description of a high mountain to its west, Great White Mountain, close to the highest peak of, of, of Shu, which is Mount Emei. Then we have a Green Clay Mountain. Then we have uh, more peaks and more peaks, probably continuing those of the Green Clay Mountain or nearby. Uh, then we have the Sword Tower, which is one of the main entrances into the land of Shu from the, the capital of the Tang Dynasty, from Chang'an. And then we have the conclusion, yeah, in which the poet expresses that it would have been more reasonable not to travel, but he is traveling nevertheless. So let's go then. Damn, how high and dangerous the road to Shu is hard, harder than climbing to the sky. So we get the introduction from the very first lines that, you know, this is a difficult quest entering the land of Shu with the perilous high mountains and with the probably very rough and rudimentary pathways that existed at the time and some of which we will comment uh, about in a minute. But 
notice from the beginning the typically hyperbolic style of Li Bai in, in, in stating that the, this road is as hard as climbing to the sky. Yeah? And later on he will say that the height of the mountains is so much, it's just a foot away from the heavenly vault itself. Next stanza. San Tsong and Yu Fu were first to find this boundless land. 40,000 years went by before folk risked the border pass to settle here. So these two, this couple, Tsang, Tsong, Yu Fu, I think were mythical brothers of a group of five who were supposed to be the first uh, human dwellers into the land of Shu. So a long time ago, humans came here. But the last line of the couplet is interesting. 40,000 years went by before folk risked the border pass to settle here. So um, the region of Shu was for most of classical, of the ancient Chinese history of, of, of the period of the Western Zhou dynasty, and until well into the Eastern Zhou, all, almost the Warring States, it was a semi-barbaric or barbaric region that wasn't part of, of, of the, the, the Middle Kingdom, of the different feudal states of the Zhou court. Around the year 300 BC, the territory was conquered by the Western state of Qin, and then was when it became open to Chinese civilization and where the public works and irrigation sponsored by the Kingdom of Qin turned the, the plain of Chengdu in the middle of, of Shu into a very prosperous agricultural region. Next stanza. West, there's great white mountain with only pathways fit for birds towards the peak of Mount M.A. Brave men have died in sudden landslides, on stairs of stone that hook to heaven. At the topmost peak, six dragons guard the sun. Below, charging waves attack the river's progress. Even skillful cranes can't fly across, and monkeys sulk that they're stuck below. So first we get the description of these great mountains to the west of Sichuan, which would have been uh, the opposite direction in which a traveler, the, the, the Levi traveler is traveling, uh, probably. So these mountains of the west are very high. And interesting, we mentioned landslides, which have occurred even in recent years. There was an earthquake in Sichuan a few years ago. And uh, many men have died in sudden landslides on stairs of stone that hook to heaven. Now, one characteristic of the mountain passes that entered into Sichuan was that in some areas they were very frail. So, so, so in some of the passes, the mountain side had been drilled with holes and wooden planks had been attached to those holes. In this very precarious structures through which no more than a man on horseback or perhaps a, a chariot at most could pass in one way, were the main entry points into Sichuan, and they also guaranteed its safety. So in the historical chronicles, we read how when Li Bai, sorry, not Li Bai, um, uh, the, the, the founder of the Han Dynasty, Liu Pang, uh, entered into this land, he dismounted those uh, wooden planks and bridges to avoid his enemies from following him. So it was a pretty effective measure. It was, as, as we've said before, it's quite an isolated land and easy to defend. Another thing that's interesting to to underline in this stanza is the fortress-like imagery that is emphasized in describing these mountains. So, at the topmost peak, six dragons guard the sun. Below, charging waves attack the river's progress. Take a look at the verbs. Guarding the sun. Attacking the river's progress. They are images of, of violence, of defense, of warfare. So, as I've said, images of, uh, of a defended fortress that is well able to, to attack and also to defend. Those six dragons guarding the sun, we might imagine, will be probably crags or other peaks surrounding the topmost peak of the mountain. And uh, this elevation and, and the unassailability of this fortress mountain is also represented by Two creatures, one from high, one on low, who just cannot conquer it. The cranes can't fly across it, it's just too high. The monkeys can't climb upwards, they have to remain below. Okay, next stanza. Those winding paths of green clay mountain, 
they zigzag through the boulders, nine turns each hundred steps, touch Orion, pass by Gemini, gazing up with awe, clutch your chest, sit down, and gasp for breath. So now we get transferred to another mountain, Grey Clay Mountain. I've also seen it described as Mad Mountain in other translations, which must be in a different area. The, the, the main focus in this one is how it's so craggy, so difficult to climb, that all, any path that zigzags up it, every nine turns, yeah, you have nine turns of a zigzag every few hundred steps. Again, it's hyperbolic, but it's, there's no straight way up Green Clay Mountain. And it's so high you can touch the stars when you're on top of it. And the next two stanzas keep describing the landscape. I don't think they're specifically about Green Clay Mountain, but you know they continue describing the harshness, the elevation, the wildness of the mountain landscape blocking the entrances to Shu. When will the traveller heading west turn back? These cliffs are just too hazardous to climb. Birds cry mournfully in ancient trees. Males pursued by females flutter through the woods and listen to that cuckoo crying to the moon, voicing her sorrow at the empty mountain. So the travelers introduced here, we, we already had uh, some intimations of travel from the title of this poem itself, but now we get what seems to be a rhetorical question. When will the traveler who's going to the west turn back, awed by these high mountains that seem to be so impossible to climb? And uh, this is, of course, a landscape without human presence. There are big trees, but also birds. And the birds contribute to the mournfulness of, of the territory. Yeah? The birds cry mournfully. The cuckoo cries her sorrow to the moon. So it's a sad landscape, a desolate, harsh, inhuman uh, landscape. And this is emphasized by the couplets that is repeated just after this stanza. The road to Shu is hard, harder than climbing to the sky. So again, the next stanza pictures also the dangers, um, and it describes a few other natural elements that are dangerous, but, are, but which are also awe-inspiring. Bold men's faces pale on hearing of these perils. Clustered peaks, barely a foot from the sky. Withered pine trees upside down, hanging over cliffs. Flying waterfalls cascade with deafening din. Boulders roll and thunder into ravines below. With danger like this, after travelling so far, why end up here at all? So harsh nature that frightens men. Uh, again, high peaks that have already been described in previous, uh, in previous stanzas that almost touch the heavenly vault. Pine trees that are growing upside down, so you, you can imagine them falling at any moment. Uh, waterfalls, which almost make you deaf with the strength of the water sounding. Boulders that fall and that could crush anybody unlucky enough to be below them. So it's a dangerous landscape. So the next stanza again takes us back to a specific place. We've been to the Great Wild Mountain and Mount M.A. We've been to the Great um, Green Clay Mountain. Now we pass through the Sword Gate Tower, uh, which was uh, a fortress, a fortification that was built uh, um, blocking one of the passes, one of the main passes entering into the land of Shu. Sword Tower stands on one of the steepest spots. If one man guards this path, 10,000 won't break through. But if the guards are bandits, it's home to wolves and jackals. In daylight, watch for savage tigers. At night, avoid the serpents, with gnashing teeth that dribble blood and slash like a knife through hemp. Uh, this sword gate, Jian mm, Men, is very famous. And uh, another of Levi's poems, in, in its prosymmetric or rhyme prose poem, is uh, dedicated to the, store, the, 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 the sword gate, uh, the sword gate tower. So, which is, it's a fool, but it's, it's a little bit smaller than this one. And uh, there's also a very nice poem in the anthology, Poems from the Masters, 
by Emperor Xuanzong, who crossed this very mountain pass and fortress when he was running away from his capital after the uh, Lushan Rebellion. And he has a poem about this uh, stone, uh, this stone gate tower. So this is a great post. Uh, the poem very clearly says, even one man alone can block access to thousands. He might be a little bit hyperbolic, but he is truthful up to a point. There's a danger, though, if instead of men here we have villains, it would be a wonderful spot for thieves, uh, which are referenced as, as wolves and jackals. Yeah, A wonderful fortress for attacking people. And wild animals, tigers and snakes, roam the area and are extremely dangerous. It's fine to dream of the brocade city, but better to have stayed at home. So the brocade city is Chengdu, uh, the capital of, uh, of Shu, of the area of Sichuan. It was called the brocade city, among other nicknames, because during the Han Dynasty, uh, it was an, an area famous for the quality of its brocades. And the government uh, had, had created an office of the, the brocade administrator or manager, in the city of Chengdu. So this is a wonderful city. During many times, it was one of the most prosperous cities of the empire, a place of wealth and beauty. But uh, Li Bai is telling us, okay, it's a beautiful place, but it's so hard to come that one shouldn't really have come. And finally, the conclusion. The road to Shu is hard, harder than climbing to the sky. But I'll crawl on westward with a heavy sigh. So the poet says, yes, this road is hard, Yes, it's a big and dangerous effort to try to enter the land of Shu, but now I'm almost there, and now, even with uh, some peril and difficulties ahead of me, I'm not turning back, and I'm entering this well-protected land. <laughs>